Welcome to the Lou Catino Show, where we can learn to reimagine our lifestyle. Dr. Anil de Cruz, it's a pleasure, honor, privilege to have you on our show, Reimagine Your Lifestyle. I know you were mentioning it to me while we were down right now. You've come in your scrubs, your last surgery, just before this podcast was a thyroid cancer case. Correct. And you're here right now to share this with us. I, what I really appreciate is the last time we were supposed to do this, you were coming back from Australia, you were jet lagged, but yet you were like, I'm going to come and do it. I'm going to come and do it. And for whatever reason, like it's gotten postponed to today. But I really want to appreciate you taking time out to share your immense experience, your research and your knowledge and life lessons with all of our audience around the world. I know you've been the, the director at Tata Memorial for for 30 plus years? No, no, I was working at the Tata, at Tata for 30 Memorial years, for 30 but years. I was director for 10. For 10 years, okay. And now you're director with Apollo Hospitals. Director Oncology. Oncology. The Apollo Group. Great, Correct. thank you so much. It's a real privilege because I've been following your work and that's how I started, you know, putting a lot of our work together with your research, you know, particularly about the combination of alcohol, smoking, vaping. So we will talk about that. But first, doctor, you know, did you ever think, did you want to be in oncologist? Did you want to be an oncosurgeon? Can you take us through your life journey right before your practice, your dreams, and up to where you are today? Uh, firstly, thank you for having me on the show. Just like you went through the work that I do, I have gone through the work and I hear about you from so many people. Thank you. I also think what you do is very, very important for good health. Uh, good health when you're healthy to make your health better, which is a very, very important part of uh, well-being of a person, but also for people when they battle diseases such as cancer. So congratulations on all that you oh, do. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Uh, about <coughs> me, uh, I grew up in a family where we have five siblings. My elder two brothers, uh, you know, in those days, in my, uh, in my times, you had to be a doctor, an engineer, a chartered accountant. There were just few jobs and most of us kind of studied and went into one of these. My elder two brothers were from the engineering background. My time came to decide what I wanted to do in my professional life. I loved catering. I thought maybe uh, I could make a career in catering. But I guess at that time it wasn't so huge. And my mother with the, I don't know if it's tears in her eyes, but she said, son, I mean, uh, two engineers and what are you going into catering? That time it was, who knows, I may have been as famous as Sanjeev Kapoor, <laughs> had a different kind of lifestyle. But then I got into med school. I had this weakness for medicine as well. Mm -hmm. Got into med school, worked my way up through the ranks. Uh, I always wanted to become a surgeon. I did study and got into surgery. The choice was between two subjects, either cardiac or oncology. And as I say, the good Lord has a plan for each one of us. So when I finished my med school and I was looking for post-graduation, Tata Memorial Hospital had post-graduation in surgery, offered me a seat. And then, as they say, the rest is history. I just grew up the ranks, got absorbed on the faculty, uh, went from assistant professor to associate professor to professor. I was allotted the department of head and neck, which is India's commonest cancer. Mm -hmm. And 90% of them are preventable because of tobacco, and that's why I have this passion. 90% preventable. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Right. If you take away ahead. thyroid cancer, the majority yeah. are tobacco, alcohol. Yeah. We, uh, I'll tell you about uh, two, three things in cancer that we could prevent. And that's it. And then I'm, I'm a doctor and I love what I'm doing. When I got the head and neck position, the more glamorous uh, subspecialities may be things like gastrointestinal and thoracic. And I wanted to do gastrointestinal initial in my training. I got head and neck. I've never looked back because it's India's commonest cancer. 
you treat a lot of people who are from the low socioeconomic strata. I mean, it affects everybody, but they are a lot from the low socioeconomic strata. Because of the sheer volumes of patients we see in this country, I was able to do some minor research that impacted not only in the country, but at the global level. So some of the research that I did uh, are now part of guidelines the world over. Wow. And uh, it's been a great <coughs> journey. And I, I loved uh, what I've done. I love being a doctor. I like to treat. And I think that rubbed off and I motivated one of our two sons to take medicine as well. So that's my story in brief. And which field is he practicing in? So he opted for surgery, surgery. as well. Okay. Uh, he's training to be a surgeon in the US. Okay. And uh, he's chosen colorectal cancer, mm. which is probably the number one. I won't say the number one, but the cancer, which is in very high mm. incidence in the US as well. Wow, what a story. So like you, I did catering. I did my oh, IHM. Wow. But I think I was guided, like you say, I always believed as a plan. You know, I had no idea why I was in it. I didn't have the idea to be a chef. I think my best friend's dad was the general manager of the Taj in Goa. So we used to spend weekends eating free food, swimming. So I said, hey, I want to be a general manager and have all those free things. But in those three years of my hotel management course, I discovered food science and nutrition. And that opened up my interest in anatomy and everything else. And then I think cancer and immunity, immunology came way, way later when you decide that, hey, these are the fundamentals and sure. you want to work on that. So yeah, that catering thing made me think of my days as well. But doctor, I love what you said about you enjoy what you do. It clearly shows in the work that you do, the way people speak about you. You know, your name is sought after by our patients everywhere. Like, you know, can we speak to Dr. Anil de Cruz? What would he say? All of that stuff. And that's why we work very, very closely with Shalini and Tata Memorials because we believe their first, second, third opinions or whatever it is, you know, are based on so much of experience of the kind of cancers that exist in India. I want to go back to what you said about the preventable part of head and neck, which is obviously tobacco control. And you've written beautiful research on the combination, people isolate research, alcohol is bad or smoking is bad. But your research paper on the combination of the two, I would love for you to talk about that, the impact on the human body at an immune level, cancer and all of these things. I would love for you so to talk quickly, about that. So quickly, let me tell you, I never choose an opportunity to speak on prevention in cancer. Mm -hmm. I think we must be the first profession that treat cancer patients but go about advocating that cancer is preventable. Yeah. Stop your habits yeah. and don't come to me. Who, which profession would do that? People yeah. would want more business for themselves. Yeah. But quickly, there are three factors uh, that cause cancer and these are preventable. One are the habits. Mm -hmm. Among the habits are tobacco and alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, tobacco is responsible for lung cancer. Lung cancer is the number one cancer globally. 18% of all cancers, lung cancers, you have a very high mortality. Uh, head and neck is another cancer that's tobacco related and tobacco can cause close to 12 to 14 cancers in the body. Mm. So it's not only where tobacco acts but it's uh, even when it's absorbed uh, you can have uh, cancer. So this is the chewing and the smoking. smoking. I, I'll matter. tell you that. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. the big, the first big preventable thing for cancer is habits. Mm -hmm. The second are infections. Mm -hmm. That's the hepatitis infection, the human papilloma virus that used to be uh, the number one, or uh, it is the uh, cause of cervical cancer. Cervical cancer used to be the number one cancer in females. Today in the West, the human papilloma virus is responsible for one of the fastest growing head and neck cancers and that's oropharyngeal wow. cancer. Oropharyngeal is basically your tonsil and your base of tongue. Hmm. Why do you get it? Uh, like cervical cancer, which is known to be because of HPV. So it's like a sexually transmitted disease. Multiple partners or poor hygiene. You get the HPV, it affects the, cervic the cervix in women. Same way oropharyngeal cancers in the West 
is seen in younger people, multiple partners and people who have a lot of oral sex. So it is again preventable. It's, it, it's, it's a cancer that's increasing in incidence uh, abroad and I'm sure uh, in the years to come we might see those kind of figures in our country as well. And the third preventable aspect of cancer is obesity. Mm. Obesity is not so important for head and neck cancer, but for various other cancers. So women who are postmenopausal and are overweight run the risk of five or six cancers. Exactly mm. the same with males. Pancreas, colorectal cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer. I mean, these are all cancers that uh, uh, occur because of obesity. So uh, if you stay away from your habits, lead a healthy, clean lifestyle, that means you're vaccinated against hepatitis, uh, human papilloma virus, practice safe sex, and are not obese, about half our cancers would be prevented. Wow. Now, coming wow. specifically to head and neck cancer, the head and neck cancers are of two types. One are mucosal. Mucosal means the lining of your mm -hmm. oral cavity, your throat. These are predominantly <coughs> caused because of tobacco mm -hmm. and alcohol and the human papilloma, which I told you. Yeah. In head and neck, you have another chunk of cancers, which are like the thyroid cancers, the salivary gland cancers, tumors in the neck. These are not directly linked to tobacco. But of all cancers in the head and neck, about 60-70% uh, would be mucosal cancers, which mm -hmm. are tobacco-related cancers. Now, thyroid cancer, which is not tobacco-related, is also increasing in incidence. So many people have thyroid nodules, swellings mm. in the thyroid region, but that's, those are goiters. But now the incidence of thyroid cancer is also increasing. Let's keep thyroid apart and just discuss on this mucosal squamous cell cancers. Tobacco, number one cause. Alcohol, equally important. But when you take both habits, the carcinogenic effects of tobacco are potentiated in the background of those who have alcohol. So many people believe if the incidence of tobacco causing you cancer is X percent and alcohol is Y percent, the incidence is not X plus Y but it's X into Y, the wow. action is potentiated. And usually people have multiple habits. They will drink and at the same time smoke. Mm. So that places you at a much, much, much higher risk. Wow. There was a time when we believed alcohol, one or two pegs is okay, permitted, moderation, tobacco should not be taken. But now there's growing body of evidence that alcohol is carcinogenic mm -hmm. and you should not take it. Let's focus on tobacco. Tobacco in our country is consumed in four forms. We smoke it, we chew it, we apply it to our gums, parts of Maharashtra, Mashiri, they burn the tobacco and they apply and it's inhaled in the form of snuff. Mm -hmm. All four forms can cause cancer. Mm -hmm. Science does not know what quantity or who is susceptible. So you may be smoking two packets a day or a patient will tell me, someone will tell me, my grandfather lived till 80, he used mm. to smoke two packets a day. Your grandfather is lucky. Yeah. I've seen people who have one or two cigarettes a day and yeah. are not so lucky. They didn't leave, they didn't live to be grandfathers, they didn't even look after their kids properly because they got cancer and succumbed. Mm -hmm. So tobacco in any form or any quantity is absolutely no. Now I'm going to tell you two other things that your uh, people watching the show should know. Apart from tobacco in any form, many people go for light cigarettes in, in between they were Daniel lights yeah. and Marlboro lights and yeah. these lights. 
selling it to women and now we have the shisha and vaping mm. so we are selling tobacco in a different form all harmful yeah. all harmful so there's absolutely no way that you should be taking tobacco whether it's smoking whether it's chewing whether it's taking a light whether it's taking shisha all harmful mm-hmm. the other thing in our country is people chew and many people chew the areca nut or the supari yeah. as we call it please remember that the supari or areca nut is also carcinogenic mm. so many people have these sada packets sada means plain packets without tobacco these little pan masalas that are a mixture of the supari the kate chu the lime some flavorings mm-hmm. they're not tobacco so they think they're fine yeah but the areca nut is carcinogenic mm. if you look at the ir which is the international agency of research in cancer areca nut is group 1 carcinogenic wow. and mm-hmm. it's the fourth most psychoactive compound known to mankind that's why it's addictive so many people yeah. take it and in our country it's very 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 peculiar we have a condition known as oral submucous fibrosis people who chew just the supari or the betel nut get what is known as submucous fibrosis the lining fibrosis of your mouth so your mouth doesn't open mm. it's kind of uh, stays closed intolerance to spices all this gives a problem and predisposes people to get cancer wow so doctor in your research you you know you keep bringing this out and i know your passion towards prevention as well <clears throat> where do you think you know there's awareness you watch a movie today in a theater and inox it starts off showing you a face of you know damage because of the cancer and stuff like that works for some people doesn't work for others you've counseled and i'm sure spoken to so many patients where do you think that human behavior has to change in order for people to realize that these you know these are killers how do we inspire people children today children are waving it's so common you know so with your experience if you had to be so, the minister to solve this problem what would it be yeah. so uh many people so i'll i'll, I'll make a few points firstly sure. if you take to tobacco the majority take to tobacco in their teens or early 20s mm-hmm. if you don't smoke by the age of 20 25 don't take tobacco don't chew it's very unlikely that you are going to take to this habit subsequently mm. so the first thing is all our efforts should be targeted on our youngsters school and colleges mm-hmm. what we do is we try to put our efforts on kicking the habit on older people yes we must do it to them as well but see that youngsters stop taking to the habit in the first place that is very very important second whenever people are addicted it's usually peer pressure mm. i am the don in the college <clears throat> smoking people look up to me people feel that they must smoke so that is now when you take to tobacco or to any psychoactive compound there are two types of dependences one is a psychological dependence and the second is a physical dependence so if i drink a whole bottle of whiskey a day the day you stop me drinking i have physical dependence mm-hmm. i get violent i get tremors exactly the same for people who smoke 30 40 50 60 cigarettes uh, they have physical de- but the majority of us have psychological dependence mm-hmm. we think small quantities talk them explain to them the harmful effects many of them will kick the habits you must work on these behavioral modifications in a sustained effort talk to people who smoke mm. majority understand it's bad majority at the back of their mind want to give mm. it up mm. they make attempts to give it up but are unable to like mark twain said 
tobacco is the easiest habit to give up. I've given it up 99 times. Mm. But they keep coming back and they take it. So our effort should be sustained. Now, when you look at what makes people stop tobacco, you could do pictorial warnings on, mm. uh, you can do media warnings, you can talk to people for behavioral modifications. The one effect that is most is not making the product available to youngsters. Yeah. Mm. And that is not banning. Mm. That is raising taxes. Mm. Because these products are cheap, freely available, people take to it. You can go out, buy a packet of one yeah. of these things to chew. You could buy BDs, cheap cigarettes. These are not price regulated. So the high-end products, there's a dip. People have realized and they are stopping. So that's why companies now are trying to give you the vaping device and make yeah. it more fancy. They're reinventing the wheel. So I think we need to see that our youngsters don't have access to these products. Government need to have strong legislation, raise taxes, regulated sales. And I think that will have an impact yes. on stopping. And of course, you explain youngsters in school, colleges, it's part of their curriculum, harmful effects of all these. They're taught a little bit about cancer. Cancer was not part of major curriculums, even in med school and other things. It's now changing. But uh, yes, if you educate people, we will have people who will give away this habit. Right. And doctor, since we're on the topic of smoking, what about passive smoking? Can you oh, talk? That's, yeah, I'd that's love very, to. very important. Yeah. So when I smoke, the cigarette smoke that goes into my lungs is called mainstream smoke. Mm -hmm. When I inhale or the smoke that comes from the burning end of my cigarette is called side stream smoke. Mm -hmm. Now, if you live in the vicinity of someone who is a constant smoker, particularly in your home, in your work environment, you are inhaling the same smoke that I am directly inhaling. So you run the increased risk not only of cancer, but of various other problems. Mm. So let's look at it. If you're a smoker and there are kids growing up, your kids yeah. in the house, kids whose parents smoke may be more prone to get upper respiratory tract infections. They lose school days because of these infections. Ladies whose husbands smoke run an increased incidence of lung cancer because mm. they're inhaling these smokes. So uh, uh, passive smoking is risky for anybody in the environment and that's why today in most places you're not allowed to smoke in public yeah. places. So that way our government has also taken that legislation. Yeah. You can't smoke in airports, you can't mm -hmm. smoke in aircrafts. Apart from the security hazard, it's also because of health. You can't smoke in government uh, mm -hmm. buildings, government hospitals. You go so often to Sloan Kettering. Mm -hmm. uh, Sloan Kettering, you'll see people in the bitter cold come outside, outside to, to smoke. smoke. Yeah. And when they come outside to mm -hmm. smoke, the convenience of having a cigarette in your in your office is easier. The temptation is more, but if you have to go out, you will mm -hmm. postpone your smoking. Yeah. That will decrease the incidence of smoking as well. Yeah. So yes, passive smoking is bad. And, you know, so if, for example, hypothetically, I smoke right now, my clothes pick up the smell. If I'm holding a young child, a baby against me when I go home, are those toxic fumes which are attached to no, it, can it create a problem no it's basically okay. what happens the when side you stream inhale, basically when you inhale okay. when you exhale the burning end of your smoke what the baby will inhale it's just what a smell. the child what your wife your yeah. companion what they would inhale that is what is the risk the risk factor. factor of it yeah because we've noticed that a lot of parents they smoke outside but they go back immediately home and they're cuddling their babies and stuff like that without no, even that's, showering. That's, that's not, not that's, that's good not, to know. Yeah. Okay, all right. So doctor, I wanted to ask you, you know, from the first day of surgery till now, okay, what's changed in you every time you open up 
a body or you do a surgery? What do you learn from a patient? You have your skill as a surgeon. So for example, let me put it this way. So uh, a neurosurgeon in Stanford tells me like 30 years ago, his first surgery, he was like, I just did a surgery. Today, when I open it up, I see a patient who's suffering, who has voids, getting sick over and over again, and that kind of a thing. Every time you open it, I'm sure you see a bad habits obviously cause this. You know, what's your journey as a surgeon from day one till now? Every time you do a surgery, what's going on in your mind with what you're seeing? And how does that, you know, make you more passionate as a surgeon and your research? Yeah. Uh, you know, they say as a surgeon, you go through a, a, a change in how you do so so the first decade of surgery is uh, you learn how to operate you mm. want to keep operating your patients but as you come of age you learn when not to operate so initially you're very trigger happy you want to just operate everybody and then you introspect and wonder whether your surgery is going to benefit the patient. It's not only about operating. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, most of us as in surgery learn the trade. We have an inherent skill. We, we know how to operate. But every time I go into an operating room and come out, I introspect. I introspect if the surgery went clean, like, you know, absolutely a dream. I introspect why did it go so well? Did I do something different? Was mm -hmm. the tumor different? So that I can reapply that knowledge when I go back into surgery subsequently. And this I'm telling you after being 30 years in mm -hmm. surgery. Every case is not the same. Mm -hmm. Every patient is not the same. And when I come out of surgery and sometimes I feel maybe this tumor didn't come out as it should. It need not be because of me. It could be because of the location of the tumor, the biology of the tumor. I introspect. Could I have done something else before I went in? Been a little better planned? Could I? So introspection to have a continued quest to improve what I'm doing to your patients. Also, like I said, when you are young, you just tend to operate mm. and you don't look at the patient holistically. Uh, as you get more senior, you understand the various aspects to a patient. You try looking at patients a little more holistically. You get other specialities involved. You care for the emotion of the patient. Mm. You look at the relatives of the patient. You look at the financial aspects apart, nutrition, apart from just the mm. operation itself. So I think that evolves with time. You know, you, you look at it a little more holistically and uh, treat your patients more wholly. Doctor, with the amount of work you've been doing, and I know how busy your schedule is, so when you have low moments in life or difficulties or stress like everyone has, what are your mechanisms? How do you manage your levels? How do you unwind? How do you relax? How do you handle maybe a difficult case or a loss case or, you know, any, what are your mechanisms? So firstly, I must tell you, and I hope this doesn't sound cliched, I love my work. So at work, I can see that. <laughs> at work, I rarely be uh, stressed. In mm. fact, if my OPD is light or one day I have a less operative list, that's a bigger stress <laughs> than having too much. So I really enjoy I get my that. work. Yeah. So my first uh, first thing to anybody, whatever you do, love, love what it. you do. Mm. Young people come to me and say, I finished my medical school. What should I take as a subject for post-graduation? I tell them, of course, it's driven by what you get. Because today competition is intense. But take a subject that gives you happiness. happiness. Yeah. You take that, you'll be good. Mm. Now, apart from that, yes, we go through certain uh, low phases in our life, both personal and professional. So what I would do is try to unwind doing something out of my profession. Listen to music, mm. uh, maybe uh, go for a long walk. That gives me a high better than the finest scotch I might drink. <laughs> I would kind of unwind, uh, exercise, uh, go for a walk, uh, mm -hmm. listen to music, 
I'm not a very strong TV man to unwind. Mm -hmm. uh, spend time with friends. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm low and stressed, I would just talk about my problems with people who I mm -hmm. trust. And uh, that would be the way that I would unwind. Uh, I mean, my problems have never been so much that I need to go to someone professionally mm -hmm. and advise. But yes, talk to friends, relatives, people uh, who would... Uh, uh, guide me sincerely and properly, that's the way I would uh, unwind. So you do believe in expression? Yeah. You do believe in expression of emotions? I always say yeah. half the problems in the world are caused because we bottle up Suppress. Beautiful. and we yeah. don't talk to Absolutely. each other. Yeah. Share your problems. Share mm. it. People love a scandal in someone else's house. That's a word of caution I must give people. <laughs> so you don't have to go about tom-toming your problems to everybody. Yeah. But yes, among people you trust. And I'm sure most of us do have mm. people, close friends, family. Yeah. And those are the kind of people that you should seek help from. That's beautiful. Uh, doctor, I would love for you to talk on your research on curcumin because it's blown out of proportion People overuse it. <clears throat> Some people underutilize it because of lack of knowledge. So I would love for you to talk about curcumin and your research. And what got you into researching curcumin anyway? So uh, about two or three decades back, there was a lot happening on curcumin. Let me take you back <coughs> to the times of our grandparents and mm. Ayurveda and things like that. Curcumin was a very powerful antioxidant. Mm. Curcumin... There was a company called uh, Vico. Vico. They, they made two products. These ads used to play on TV when I was a kid. Vico Turmeric Vanishing Cream and Vico oh, yeah. Vajradanti, the toothpaste. The toothpaste, yeah. Because we believed it was inherent in our, in our culture that curcumin is well. So basically curcumin is simple haldi, mm -hmm. turmeric. Now we know that it has antiseptic and antioxidant properties. There was a lot of work coming out of the MD Anderson at that time, uh, working in cell culture labs and various other institutions that in the labs, it slowed down the growth of cancer cell lines. Hmm. So here we had a powerful tool to look at whether it could help us potentiate what we are doing, be synergistic in what we are doing, could help us in prevention of cancer. Around that time, the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India said, let's research on curcumin. Why are these foreigners doing it? It's our mm. product. We should be doing. So they called an expression of interest for grants to research on curcumin. I sincerely believe that it would help. So I applied for that grant and I was awarded the grant. But much before that, when I was in the U.S. training at the Sloan Kettering, uh, I did understand that curcumin has got a very unique property. If you eat curcumin, it doesn't get absorbed. Mm. It's all passed out. 90% is passed out in your stool. So it had to have a local action. How do you make curcumin act locally? So I worked with people to devise lozenges with curcumin impregnated in that. So you can suck it because a lot of people with oral cancer, which is the number one head and neck cancer in our country, uh, the warning sign is you get color changes in your lining. So mm -hmm. you get white patches called leukoplakia, pre-malignant. Uh, if you take curcumin, you can reverse those changes rather than operate them. Mm -hmm. Chemo prevention to change a pre-malignant wow. condition. Yeah. So that's how I got interested in doing this research. Unfortunately, curcumin is known to act, but we've not got the magic bullet. Take so many parts per million, mm -hmm. add it with these kind of products and you would be able to prevent a, a cancer. Hmm. So that does not work. So what I do in my line is, a lot of people with these patches, I tell them, take the natural curcumin, that's the kachi haldi, not the one that you use in cooking. Not the powder, yeah. Mm -hmm. Make a paste of it, topically apply. 
Wow. And I see a lot of wonderful changes. Sometime wow. when they're on radiotherapy, we research this as well, hmm. whether it could decrease the side effects. Hmm. So it helps. But as I said, we don't have it in the right formulation that you can go to a chemist store, pick it up hmm. and incorporate it into treatment. Coming to curcumin, any uh, or expanding the talk on curcumin, any antioxidant is good. Yeah. So even if you had to take green tea, mm. it's known to be chemo preventive. Yeah. You take a diet rich in vitamin A, C and E, mm -hmm. chemo preventive. There are more than a thousand epidemiological studies. That means looking at cancer incidence out in populations, people who eat a chemo preventive diet yeah. have a lower incidence of cancer. Mm. There are studies done in the field for esophageal, other cancers. So researchers tried to give this vitamin A, C and E in artificial form. There were trials like the ATBC trial. ATBC is ATBC, alpha tocopherol, which is vitamin E, e yeah. BC, beta carotene, mm -hmm. carrot trial. That's carotene and retinoic efficacy trial, carrot trial. When you gave these antioxidants in the artificial form, no benefit. Yeah, yeah, I read Take that. Take it in yeah. the natural form, benefit. Mm. So again, I tell people, they keep telling me, my nephew sent me these bottles from the US. No. Should I take yeah. it? Should I? I tell them, eat a diet rich in vitamin yeah. A, C and E. Green leafy vegetables, yeah. colored fruits, colored vegetables, and you've got the ingredient, right? There's an old Japanese saying, have four colors on your plate every day and you mm. live to be 110. Mm. And that's your beta carotene, alpha yeah. tocopherol. You're eating it in the natural form. I, I love that you brought that up because we actually get fearful when our patients bring these jars of vitamin A, which is synthetically toxic, actually toxic to the body. And uh, we have to get them to now start, you know, even if it's a head and neck patient who can barely open their mouth, but we're trying to get liquid nutrition too. You can still puree natural foods. Of course. You know, and put that in their system. Now, I love what you spoke about because I recently just finished an advanced course with the University of Arizona, Dr. Andrew Whale, Integrative Oncology, where he's put a subject on cancer and nutrition because it's constantly evolving. You know, science is changing, so we're learning new foods. And the two top foods which are standing out in every part of the cancer system, whether it's angiogenesis, DNA repair, is curcumin and green tea. It, Both very powerful antioxidants. Yeah. Very and powerful. And of course, everything else you said, but that's standing at the top. And he always says, next year my course is going to be different because we're constantly researching new foods. But yeah, I love what you said about that. Green tea and uh, curcumin. Cur Doctor, you spoke about living to 100, and just before this podcast, you spoke about your dad who's 96 years old. And whenever I meet people who have crossed 75, 80, I get interested because, you see, I can listen to social media and people preaching about what you need to do to live long, or I can talk to the people who are actually living long rather than wait for that science to come. And your dad is 96 years old, and I would love for you to repeat that conversation, you know, where I asked you, what are your observations? How has he reached 96? What are the, some of the things you're, you see him doing that as a researcher, as a hardcore oncosurgeon, you know, like, hey, this is it. This makes sense to me. And you don't even need to go and research it. It just hits you straight up there. So let me first tell you my dad's 96. Many people tell me I live to 110 because I've got good genes. Mm. But his father and mother passed away, the father went in his 50s and mm -hmm. mother in the early 60s. So it's not genetic. Yes, mm. genetics is important, but his everything. parents yeah. didn't live till mm -hmm. 90 and 100. Mm -hmm. So there must have been something correct in what he did. Now, my father ate everything, but he ate in moderation. Mm -hmm. He may not have the best figure. He may be a little obese. He's got a big belly, but he, he did everything in moderation. He liked his drink, but in moderation. I would never see my father finish half a bottle of whiskey any day or totter on the way home. Mm -hmm. He would have, he would relish yeah. his, his, his drink. Two important points that I would say. One, very disciplined. So he would have his meals at proper times. 
he would know the portion that he wanted and it would be kind of balanced. And the second thing that I would say is that he's active. Even mm -hmm. now at 96, because of his slightly being overweight, he did have spinal surgery. So he okay. does walk with a walker, mm -hmm. mentally very clear because we didn't do the full fixation. I operated him when he was 93, so we couldn't, wow. you know, fix it. So we just decompress the spine, so he needs a walker, so he's active. And I think the third most important thing is, he's not cribbing, he's not coveting someone else's mm. money. He's not looking at trying to invest too much in shares. I mean, he is happy. What the Lord provides, he is happy with. So I think he's happy in his mind. Sometimes mm -hmm. I tell him, so-and-so is invested in shares and you don't have any shares. He has no shares. Mm -hmm. The regular investments to take him through to this age, he'll say, put, and then you'll see when you lose it, it'll burn <laughs> and then you'll have more problems. So I think that is it. Everything yeah. in moderation, active and a happy mind. And what you just told me ties in with the real solid research that is coming up on longevity today. The state of our human mind, Absolutely. feeling good, irrespective of what's happening around, balance, moderation. You know, none of the people, centenarians or people in their 90s are popping supplements like, you know, everyone else is thinking that this supplement is going to make me live longer. And the solid science is now coming towards that. You know, and that's why the drink, a lot of research happening that, you know, the food doesn't matter. It matters, of course. But if we feel good as human beings, even the medicine works better. Absolutely. Everything works better. So let me tell you, Luke, yeah. I'll tell you when I treat patients, you have patients of different types. Yeah. So there's some who I call the eternal cribbers. <laughs> even if there's a small problem, I don't blame them. They're going through stress. Hmm. But even a small problem, doctor, this happened, doctor, this happened. Yeah. I somehow feel those are the guys who have little more complications in surgery. Mm, those are the beautiful. guys who may have prolonged hospital stay. Mm -hmm. But there are certain guys who are very positive. Doc, I'm going to get this tube out in two days. Trust me. You're saying five days. Mm. I'll get it out in two days. I'll be walking in two <coughs> days. Those guys do it. Yeah. So it's also the positive attitude. So the power of the mind. You do believe in the placebo of effect. Of course. Use the right of way. Of course. Of course. Yeah. If you look at people even in Western world who are treated for cancers, two-thirds of them couple the regular treatment with some sort of integrative or alternate treatment. Powerful mm. mind could yeah. be prayers, could be a mm. diet modification, mm. could be antioxidants with their treatment. Most people do it and many of these are proven to be useful. Yeah, I, I realize the placebo effect. We, we learned about it in integrative medicine, how to integrate it, never to use it as false hope, never to use it to sell snake oils and stuff. I remember it was New Year's in Goa and there was a big party happening and I looked forward to, to it the entire year. And that day I was feeding the dogs and maybe some of the saliva while playing went into my mouth and I had that severe gastro problem. My dad took me to the doctor and the doctor said, I need to admit you and you know, give you some injections and stuff like that. Just the thought of me missing the party, the doctor said, I'm gonna go and send a nurse in to do all the formalities. I got off the bed with zero pain, went for the party, came back, everything had disappeared. Just the thought of missing the party. And I know I was sick because I had wrenching, I, I, I was, my gut was wrenching, I was vomiting, and I, until date, that just plays how my mind wanted to look forward to something so strongly, I experienced the placebo effect. You know, so I think it's really powerful and if it's used the right way. Have you ever used that giving, how do you give hope to your patients, doctor? How do you have conversations with them you when know, they've given up? You yeah. know, it's tough because yeah. very often in cancer, we know that patients are presented with advanced cancer. Yeah. We know that there's only a certain percentage of who I'll be able to cure. So whenever I speak to the patient, no one wants to be told absolute truth. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I never lie to my patient. Mm -hmm. So I will tell them the truth, but I'll give it to them slowly. And I'll coat the bitter pill with a little bit of sugar. sugar yeah. Now, when people <clears throat> understand, most studies show that if you ask, uh, if you kind of, poll responses from our patients, 
majority want to live. There's very few patients who will say, no, I don't yeah. want to live. And they want to live with a good quality of yeah. life. But when I take them into confidence and I tell them, these are what you're going to expect, I forewarn them. I tell them, listen, this is a tough battle. I have to operate you. I have to give you radio. I have to give you chemo. Then you will come in that lucky 50-60% group. Mm. Very big support from the Beautiful. patients. I yeah. forewarned them. I've talked them through. Sometimes I even, uh, I operate on the head and neck. So I take out the voice box. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to live with a hole. They lose mm -hmm. their voice, but they get rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is, when they are to my doctor, should I get operated? I sometimes just phone some of my patients. And when they talk to me on the phone, the patient signs on the consent form immediately. Mm -hmm. They just sign on the consent form. So sometimes when they relate to another patient, they see another patient in the uh, outpatient clinic outside and then they say, this guy is so good, why should I not? Yeah. That's how it is. Yeah. Wow, doctor, this has been amazing. I know you're a professor and you teach, you know, hardcore medical. But if I had to ask you to teach us a couple of life lessons today based on your entire life, as an onco, as a human being, through your experience of life, death, giving life back to people, helping people with prevention, what are some of those life lessons that you have for all of us? In so, every aspect of life, it could be anything. It doesn't have to just be health. It could be relationships, stress, whatever. So I would say first, be happy and love what you're doing. Mm. So that's my first uh, advice that uh, people would love. I love my medicine and I'm very, very happy. I have peace when I go into the hospital I'm with my patients. I just love it. So whatever you do, yeah. do it and do it with a very, very positive mind. Second, health is wealth. Mm. You're not healthy. You can have as much money as you want. You might do whatever you want. You may be the most famous guy. You come home, you're popping uh, uh, 20 tablets, you have curtailment in your quality of life. That's, so look after your health, very, very important. That's very, very important. Third, I guess, uh, have a little bit of money to feel a little bit safe. Mm -hmm. You should have security around you, your house yeah. a little bit. You don't need the moon, mm -hmm. but some amount of stability. Fourth, have a bunch of people around you, family or friends, who are close to you, who relate to you, who have uh, the same habits as you, the same likes like you. You know, you can bounce your problems about, uh, uh, through them. And I think uh, lastly, I, I'm fairly religious and I just believe there's a Lord above and you have yeah. to, you know, uh, attribute many uh, blessings that you get. And even sometimes when the going is tough, it's done with a plan. And when you look back after a couple of years, you understand why that uh, happened to you. It was with a plan and it was for the better. So I guess... Uh, very, That's very beautiful. Good. I'll pick on the last point, prayer. So in your journey, what are, some, what are some of the instances or that one memory where you know God was there with you? He's with us all the time. I believe that too. Uh, where was that one instance? Oh, many where, times. Yeah. I'll tell you in my professional career. Yeah, I want to hear one or two stories. So I, I, yeah. I'll tell you in my professional yeah. career. Uh, coming into cancer, I was not sure. I'd finished my medical school in Bangalore, uh, uh, Indira Gandhi. The, the, the uh, prime minister then was assassinated in 1984. I grew up in Delhi. Delhi was burning. I couldn't go back to Delhi. I had relatives in Bombay. So I didn't know what I'm going to do postgraduate. Most of my batchmates were flying to the US. Mm. And I thought it's good. My brothers were there. They were calling me to the US. This thing happened. And I wondered now, listen, I'm missing one of those examinations because I can't get back to Delhi. What do I do? I landed in Bombay because I had nowhere to stay in Bangalore because I had relatives here. I found out and then someone told me the Tata Memorial Hospital uh, has post-graduation. Mm -hmm. I went there and I got post-graduation. Again, I was training to be a gastro surgeon. And they interviewed me for faculty position and they said there's only head and neck available. 
I was initially disappointed. Many of my colleagues told me, I don't know whether to congratulate you getting into the Tata's, which was huge. It's the number one cancer. Mm. Or whether we should give you condolences because you've got head and neck. Mm. But I went in. Initially, I was a little, have I done the right thing? Should I have gone for gastro somewhere else? Uh, uh, with simplicity in heart, humbly, I say I rose to be a global leader in my speciality. God works through various things mm. so many times. Dr. Very often there's some uh, like an accident and you were supposed to be out at that yeah. party where there was a fire, but then you realize you went somewhere else. God, God. working. You seen miracles happen on the operating okay. table. Of course. Tell so, me one or two, please. So yeah. one of the one of the most humbling posters given to me by one of my patients. Uh, sometimes as surgeons we claim. Uh, credit not knowing that we are just doing our job and there's a supernatural power healing so uh, this was a little plaque given to me by one of my patients that read i it's a surgeon's prayer i only address the wounds god heals them mm. so yes you have sometimes very advanced tumors you operate and they do well so if i operate a hundred patients of the same stage, same surgeon, same operative team, same medicine, same operating room, why should 60 do well and 40 get their tumor back? Mm. Something's happening. Yes, patient's immunity, the mm. tumors are all the same yeah. because the stage is the same. What we understand of tumor biology today, but I guess it's that extra power that heals as well. This is so beautiful, Doctor. You've summarized in your life lessons to us what longevity is, which is lifespan and which is health span. And for longevity, we need health span. It's such a humbling experience talking to you. I've heard so much about you, read your work, and I just feel so, so good speaking to you. I think your words are going to impact our audience, your life lessons, and just how humble you've been. I mean, you know, there are good nutritionists, there are egoistic nutritionists, there are good doctors, egoistic in all aspects of life, not just medicine. But I just think, you know, when we see our patients, because our patients go around the world in desperation, and sometimes the more money you have, you start shopping around, True. you know, for doctors that, oh, this is the best in Bombay, but no, I have money. So let me fly here, let me fly there. And we see that actually breaks the continuity of treatment. It makes it more difficult for the entire team around. And then the patient comes back six months later with new problems and you wonder what's gone wrong. And they've gone through two, three different, I'm not against opinions, but I'm against like shopping and changing treatments. Sometimes it's necessary. Mostly it's an egoistic thing because you have too much of money or you're fearful to ask the right questions. Do you see that happening a lot as well, doctor? Yeah, of course. There are people, but I'll again... Uh give the audience a little bit of a message yeah. and I'll give you that message and I tell it to my relatives and others. Yes. Whenever you have a problem, sit down, a health problem, sit down and research who you're placing your trust in for your mm. treatment. Yeah. You have to buy a car, you'll ask 20 people, you'll go for five Test rides. You have to buy a television, you spend time. You, for your clothes, you'll go through various apparel stores and wonder what suits you the best. I find the richest people sometimes make silly decisions vis-a-vis -vis yeah. health. Mm -hmm. All that glitters is not gold. gold. Yes. So please see where you are placing your trust. So they will say, I'm going to hospital X. It's fantastic. It's not the hospital. All hospitals have more or less the same facilities, mm -hmm. minor variations. They'll sell you that we've got some grand technology, may not be very, very important. Choose your doctor correctly. Beautiful. Place your trust in that doctor, go through your journey. If your doctor is the right man, professionally competent, I'll tell you in, 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 in cancer, there are a lot of good oncologists, but they do everything. They'll do head and neck, they'll do breast, they'll do thoracic, they'll do stomach. You cannot be the best. When that patient needs that little fine yeah. extra, mm -hmm. you have to go to someone who's specialist. Who's specialist Look yeah. at cardiac. Yeah. There are some who do bypass. There are some who do the valve replacement. Look at 
orthopedics there are people who specialize now in knee yeah. look at eye there are people who specialize in retina mm -hmm. there are people who do the anterior chamber cataract <laughs> they're different they're corneal experts and you get that fine extra with an expert yeah. Yeah. so that i would i mean urge people do your research before you place your trust in your doctor Dr. Anil, thank you so much for your time. You know, I know you came out of a surgery. Are you going back into a surgery no, now? No, you're done for no, the day. No, no. I'm you're done for the day. You're done Go for back the day. Home. Yeah. In fact, thank you for having me on the show. I've enjoyed talking to you. I've heard a lot about you, not only from my patients, from people in the vicinity. Uh, God bless you for the wonderful work you're doing. And thank you because I'm going to get home a little early today. So it's... <laughs> And the sun's just setting, so I'm going to have a wonderful evening. No, tonight. God bless you too, doctor. I've enjoyed this conversation so much, you know, so much, because I see that humble part of you, which I hope can trans transcend into so many people who have the gifts of, you know, helping people, you know, not just through surgery, through medicine, through different fields of life, but that humble attitude and what you told me while we were walking up, feeling good is everything is something I completely resonate with. And I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Thanks. And if you need me to pull you out of surgery for future talks, I'm happy to do it. Just Lovely. let me know. Be because I cannot get enough of, you know, I think there's going to be so much. But no, that's a joke. But thank you so much. It, you've really, really, you know, opened up so many different thought processes. I know in our audience for sure. And I feel so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Lou. you, doctor. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for more. We're going to continue our journey learning, sharing, and evolving.